George R. R. Martin's beautiful and intricate world and his fascinating setup to The Dance of the Dragons is a perfect application and explainer of how good world building is not just about visuals, geography, or magic systems. In this video essay, we'll explore how game theory explains the strategies of the key players in The Dance of the Dragons and offers insight on how to create effective fictional worlds. When an author writes, each new word builds his universe, each character's decision adds to the world, and successful world builders like George create complex webs of decision making that maximize conflict to shed light on human nature. To understand that, we'll analyze one of the most consequential moments in Game of Thrones. Spoilers will follow. This is the invisible lens. In the world of Westeros, power isn't just about who sits on the Iron Throne. It's about who controls which dragons, which armies, and the loyalty of key allies. George R. R. Martin has a keen sense for how all of these elements work together, but to understand the Dance of the Dragons with game theory, let's first quantify the power dynamics in play. The most important thing you'd have to do is uh, assign a strength value to the various dragons and armies that are gathering in the Seven Kingdoms. The dragons are going to be the most important thing going forward. Uh, Aemond has the scene in the second season where he says that it's a combination of dragons and military uh, that's going to win the war, and that's kind of true, but we're going to see that debunked in the third season pretty succinctly. Of course, there are many more aspects to consider. This is an intricate story full of deeply flawed humans, after all. So we talked about dragon strength, the number of dragons, their size, experience, and writer skill and loyalty. But to define how characters perceive strength in the world, there's also military strength, the number of soldiers, quality of leadership, and resources. Also, there are alliances, the strength and loyalty of supporting houses and factions, political influence, each side's ability to gain support from neutral parties. Finally, there's public support, popularity among the common folk and lesser nobles. George R.R. R. Martin goes to great lengths to showcase the strengths and weaknesses of each side in this conflict. However, in full disclosure, some elements of this intricate web of logic are beyond the reach of any simulation. That's where good writing intersects with the spontaneous nature of human behavior. Injuries to dragons are probably a little easier to uh, include into the model, uh, simply because you should be able to track you know, how much damage a dragon has sustained, whether or not they can fly is probably going to be the most important one. But it's going to be very hard to simulate how houses and characters will react. These are all very deep, complicated people, and the way that they're going to interact with each other is not always going to be something that's predictable or even something that you can analyze. You've probably heard about the prisoner's dilemma model of game theory, where just two strategies exist, cooperate or defect. The Dance of the Dragons is a little more complicated than that, so to understand how George built it, we created a model with four strategies. Have no fear, I'll explain. To start, this is crucial to understand. Like in The Prisoner's Dilemma, neither side, the Greens or the Blacks, knows 100% what the other will do, or how strong or how weak the other side is. The Dance of the Dragons is a game of incomplete information. Contrast this with chess, where both players can see exactly what the other side has and is doing. When you build a story, you have infinite possibilities, and the decisions your characters make define how the story develops. In this case, the greens and the blacks each have four basic strategy options. To attack, represented by the sword, to defend by the shield, to bluff by the mouth, or to form an alliance by the handshake. Let's go through how some of the strategies would interact in this story so you can get the gist of the game. If both attack and are strong, 
the outcome is an intense battle, high risks, and high rewards. If one attacks and the other defends, the outcome is that the strong attacker wins decisively and the weak defender fails. If one attacks and the other bluffs, the attacker gains a moderate advantage. If one attacks and the other forms an alliance, the attacker faces moderate resistance with the alliance slightly better off. Another way to visualize it is with this payoff matrix. Each cell represents one of the 64 possible outcomes or payoffs for each team based on the strategies. Also, remember each group can be either strong or weak. The numbers in each cell show what happens when both teams choose their strategies. The first number in each cell is the payoff for the blacks, and the second number is the payoff for the greens. Rows represent the strategies chosen by the blacks. Columns represent the strategies chosen by the greens. For example, here blacks are weak intersects with greens are strong at attack. The cell shows negative one five, meaning the blacks lose a hypothetical one point because they are weak and the attack would backfire on them. Meanwhile, the greens gain a hypothetical five points because they are strong and would succeed. In the story, the characters have incomplete information. Neither team knows if the other is weak or strong. Therefore, strategy needs to be measured in terms of beliefs, that is, probabilities, about the competitor's strength. The Greens definitely have the advantage. They have all of the institutional power of King's Landing. Uh, they have the crowned monarch and they control the Iron Throne because Aegon II uh, is nominally king. They have the most powerful alliances with both Baratheons and the Lannisters on their side, uh, as well as the High Tower forces uh, in the Reach. Based on the story, we made some fair assumptions for the beginning of the dance. Greens believe there's a 60% chance that blacks are strong and a 40% chance they are weak. Rhaenyra, for her part, has control of Dragonstone, has a few vague pacts with older lords that may or may not be out of date, uh, but she also has dragon power, and that's probably the greatest resource she has at the beginning, uh, is the fact that she has theoretical control over more dragons, though one of the dragons on the green side is Vagar, which is probably the most powerful uh, dragon, or definitely the most powerful. For the blacks, we assumed they believed there is an 80% chance that greens are strong and a 20% chance that greens are weak. Knowing that, let's apply game theory to a scene. When the Dance of the Dragons started, blacks believed they were weak, so they decided to form an alliance. From that decision, the greens could react by attacking, defending, bluffing, or forming their own alliances. But Rhaenyra at this point doesn't know if the greens are weak or strong. However, we estimated that she believes the probability of greens being strong is 80%. So according to game theory, what's the best strategy for her to follow? Well, right off the bat, I would say that defend and form alliance are incredibly safe options to pick at basically every stage of the calculation. Uh, early on in the show, both sides are in a constant state of defending and forming alliances. Uh, the dragons, which are their most powerful defensive tool, are basically locked into Dragonstone and King's Landing respectively. In fact, one of the you know core uh, conflicts of the first uh, episode for the Greens is they can't really do anything with Vagar um, from a military standpoint because he needs to stay in King's Landing to defend from any other dragon attacks. Forming alliances is also very safe and probably the most important proactive uh, decision these actors can take. Uh, you can see it in season one, even when both sides dispatched dragon riders to the Stormlands to try and make an alliance with the Baratheons. And Rhaenyra also sent Jace north to make an alliance with uh, House Arryn and House Stark. So forming alliance again is very low risk, high reward, and it just makes a lot more sense to do as a constant action uh, as opposed to something like an attack or a bluff. These are actions that can be really risky, uh, considering how deadly fighting with dragons can be. It's very hard to withdraw from that conflict or manage losses, so an attack is always going to be a dedication of a significant amount of resources. Here's our calculation. We'll be quick, but skip ahead if you hate math. We multiplied the payoff by the probability to get the expected utility of each strategy. If the greens react by attacking, 
blacks gain three points if they form an alliance, and the greens attack being weak. The probability expected for greens being weak is 0.2, so 0.2 times 3. Or blacks gain negative one point if they form an alliance, and the greens attack being strong. The probability expected for greens being strong is 0.8, so 0.8 times negative 1. They result in negative 0.2. Blacks will lose utility, their well-being, if they are weak and decide to form an alliance and the greens attack. But greens can do other things. We'll summarize the math, but you can go back and check. They can defend with result 2, bluff result 2, Form an alliance, result 1, equaling 4.8. Can you see the math of world building forming in your head? Don't worry if you can't. What matters is that if the blacks are weak and form an alliance, they should expect a big gain. In the show, blacks did precisely that. They were weaker than the greens, and the strategy with the highest expected utility was to form an alliance. We won't show every calculation, but we ran the numbers and the preference ranking for the blacks was form alliance, attack, bluff, defend. Note that the expected utility of the strategies except defend are very close. So it's understandable that Rhaenyra was hesitant. The strategy of forming an alliance was the winning one, but the margin was small. Now, we calculated the expected utility of the strategies for the blacks. But what about for the greens? We ran the numbers and if the blacks are weak and form an alliance, they should expect 22.4 points of gain. The greens numbers are higher because they are stronger. According to our model, the preference ranking for the green goes like this. Attack, form alliance, defend, bluff. Now, attentive viewers will notice that if the greens believe they are strong, bluffing is not the strategy with the highest expected utility. In terms of bluffing, that takes a lot of commitment. It takes a lot of setup. The bluff that we see in season two is uh, managed by Kristen Cole and Eamon Targaryen. They lure a dragon rider from the black side to come over the sea and uh, defend Rook's Rest, which is the seat of House Staunton. And they do this bluff by hiding Vagar, the most powerful dragon, uh, in a field nearby, then springing that trap because the blacks think that it's only going to be a land soldier invasion of Rook's Rest rather than one supported by dragons. Uh, they do this by picking a very small uh, seat that's not really worth much, so Rhaenyra feels safe sending one dragon to defend it. Uh, and then the trap is sprung when Vagar and also Sunfire turn up to fight the queen who never was. So when Aemond decided to bluff in episode 4, that was a big gamble. There, greens believed they were strong and bluffed, and then blacks attacked. While losing a dragon and an experienced rider, the blacks also crippled the green king and his dragon. So in the world of thrones, even if it looks like this was a green victory at face value, our analyses of world building show that this payoff is actually in the Black's favor. Think about it. Aemon's decision to bluff would ultimately lead to a change in the dynamics of the war, and by the end of the season, the beliefs about each team's strength will have changed. So at the end of the second season of House of the Dragon, the Black's belief in their strength and the Black's belief in the green strength has changed drastically. They now believe through a combination of possessing new dragons and uh, talks with Alicent and other members of the Green Council that the Greens have very little military power. They believe that all of the dragons that they have are more than enough to deal with whichever army of men the Greens throw at them. And they also believe that there are enough dragons to scout out and avoid or even win in an outright fight against Vagar, which is at this point the Greens only real advantage. And even then it can still be countered very easily by a couple of the Black's dragons. The Greens, for their part, have a much greater respect for Rhaenyra's power and Black power because of the newfound dragons that they've had and also the resolution that they've seen in Rhaenyra and her willingness to fight directly head on. Let's visualize this new dynamic through the invisible lens, if you will, of game theory. The Blacks acquired more dragon riders, so their beliefs changed. Therefore, it's fair to assume that Greens believe there's a 99% chance that blacks are strong, 
and a minuscule chance that they are weak. Blacks believe there is a 20% chance that greens are strong and an 80% chance that they are weak. We ran these numbers and as things stand now, the best strategy for the blacks is to attack. Meanwhile, the best strategy for the greens is also to attack. Additionally, our model shows that following the logic of the story, if the greens defend, their expected utility is negative. So much of the drama of Game of Thrones comes from this intricate world that George R. R. Martin built. And this result showcases how he has an eye for setting up logical decision trees that produce good drama. His world is built with incentives for conflict among characters. For the following season, the only path forward is bloodshed. In many shows and films nowadays, you can see the strings pulling the characters to the arbitrary directions their authors want to reach. But what makes high fantasies like Game of Thrones great is that the worlds they exist in are built from this elegantly simple truth. Humans respond to incentives. There's so much to learn from game theory and its application to economics in particular. To learn more about economic theory, see our sister channel, Learn Liberty. Learn Liberty.